Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for tuning into my talk. My name is Thomas Munro, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Postgres project or PostgreSQL, um, where it came from, what sorts of things it does, um, how it is made today, um, who makes it, and uh, a bit about how I myself got involved in it and how you might get involved in it if that's something that you're interested in, or if not, how you might use it. All right. So welcome to my walking tour of Postgres. Um, I'm going to start with a really basic question. What is it? Uh, a colleague of mine, Yelta, um, on Twitter, one day sent out this excellent tweet. It was part of a longer discussion. To my non-database friends, I've started explaining Postgres as a really big Excel sheet for their web that websites can use. I think that's a great starting point for understanding just generally what databases do, database, database management systems. Um, and I'm going to try and sort of develop from there and explain in more and more technical terms what, what the project is about. So um, we can say that it's like a spreadsheet in the sense that it has tables, but the tables are a little bit more structured than um, an Excel spreadsheet. They have more fixed types and the columns have names and so on, but generally it's the same sort of concept. And there's a whole bunch of um, things that uh, that we call, that there's a sort of an idea we call the relational model that allows um, things in one table to re refer to things in other tables in a way that imposes some kind of order and avoids things getting out of sync and data from being corrupted. Um, and then there's a whole lot of um, engineering that goes into making it possible for those for that data to be updated in a sane way when there's all kinds of uh, modifications taking place at the same time while, while um, queries are being run. And queries are this kind of basic concept in databases where you say things in some kind of query language. We have this language SQL, Structured Query Language, um, which is used instead of, you know, with a spreadsheet, you might modify something with a GUI, um, whereas with relational databases like Postgres, you would use queries to insert or update or delete data. And along with insert, update, and delete, you have select, and that's a way to query and, and ask questions of the system in this kind of language that you have to learn. But actually, mostly it's computer programs that write the queries and not humans, even though the humans can also write them directly. So for example, we have a couple of tables here, department and employee, and um, there are ways to write these queries that can join together information from different tables. Um, and we, if we want to modify that data, we have to run insert, update, or delete statements, as you can see here on this slide. I'm not actually going to go into the details of the SQL language. I'm just going to talk about the the more general sort of concept of the relational model and what type of systems use that model and why it's a good idea. So um, we can say that Postgres is like um, a whole bunch of these other products. Um, and I was wondering which ones to call out. I went to the dbengines.com survey where they uh, try to track the popularity of different databases. We can see it if you look at the top 10 databases uh, that they track. You've got Oracle, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, then some other non-relational databases. Let me just highlight the ones that are relational. Out of the top 10, you can see most of them are relational. It's an extremely popular model for dealing with data. Not the only model, but it's a, a very popular one. Um, so I want to talk a bit, a bit about the origin and context of that model, how it comes to be so popular. If we go back to the 1960s, um, IBM was involved in the Apollo space program, and they were uh, they had a contract to build some type of information management system, which they called IMS, Information Management System, to keep track of the huge number of parts in the Apollo space program. And that was a hierarchical database system, one of many different kinds of database systems. And um, a man working at IBM called Edgar Codd, came up with this, he saw the difficulty people had with um, keeping track of the of data that references other data and duplicates in the information and things, ways data could become, could become corrupted over time in highly concurrent and busy systems with many, many people and systems interacting with it. And he came up with this idea, he was a mathematician, he came up with this idea of the relational model, which lets you... Um, uh, well, it, it imposes a set of rules so that data remains structured and is maintained maintains its consistency over time. 
And he published that paper around about 1970. Um, and it was until a little bit longer that IBM produced the first working system. Um, actually, I think there might've been some earlier experimental systems, but the first system that was widely used was IBM System R. And that used the SQL language. And if you look at old documentation from that system back in the mid seven, early to mid seventies, it's very familiar. It looks like the modern SQL system. Um, but it, the relational model didn't require SQL. There were other other programming languages, or sorry, I should say query languages that were competitors. Quell was a popular one, and Ingress was a very early and very successful product that used the Quell query language to, and, and, and I've met a number of people who used these Quell systems, Ingress systems in telecommunications, in just, uh, telecommunic like all kinds of big users of, of early users of computers used Quell. And the team that developed Ingress was um, Michael Stonebreaker and um, some others who were at Berkeley. And they later decided to have to, to uh, develop a second project called Postgres. Ingress stood for information, uh, Interactive Graphical Retrieval System. And Postgres was sort of the next one where they wanted to try out a, a new set of ideas. And Postgres also began with Quail as the query language. Um, so if we look at the, the, the relational model paper, we can see that some of the really big ideas, which is worth reading, by the way, and it's, it's, it's very approachable and, and readable. Um, some of the big ideas were getting away from dependence on the physical storage of the data. So um, thinking of things in terms of quite high level concepts, sets of tuples, uh, the, the word relation essentially meaning table, um, and ways of not, re not repeating yourself so that you don't have information stored in multiple places, so that it's not possible for one thing to get out of sync with another. That whole model is, um, I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but it, it, it was an extremely influential idea. Um, and here we can see, this is a paper from, I think it's from the 1970s, show, oh, sorry, 1981, showing where um, a kind of retrospective of the system R system. And it looks very familiar to a modern reader. It's clearly the ancestor of everything that we're doing in relational databases still today, many, many years later. In 1985, um, Stonebreaker and others working at um, Berkeley set out to design a new database project. And if, if you look at the this paper from 1985, they listed some of their goals. Uh, they wanted, and, and those goals, you can see the effects of these goals in the modern Postgres project. Um, for example, so one and two here, they wanted user extensibility for data types and complex objects. And we can see that still today with projects like PG Vector, which is really uh, big in the AI space right now. It's possible because of the, 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 the way, like some of the design choices made back then and this kind of goal that you should be able to, um, that complex data types and operations on those and indexes that support those should be possible even even though they're outside of what the original developers of the database system had in mind. And an, another very famous example is PostGIS, the uh, ge uh, geographical information system that uh, in involves all kinds of custom indexes and data types. And, and it's very successful in Postgres and is able to be done as an external project, essentially because of this planning. So that's, uh, that was University Postgres in the 1980s. Something else was happening at Berkeley around the same time. In 1986, there was some legal wranglings and uh, Berkeley University lawyers came up with this BSD license concept that was some of the earliest software that was released with a what we would call an open source license today. Of course, there, were, there was an open source spirit before that. People shared things and developed things co cooperatively. But um, in around 1986, that's as Postgres was being born, that software was being developed on BSD operating system computers, also Sun systems, I think. And, and so the sort of BSD license was sort of a natural thing for them to use. Uh, and to this day, we have this license that's BSD-like, and it, it has enabled Postgres to have a lot of... Um, forks, commercial um, and non-commercial, uh, which is part of the sort of flavor of the, the Postgres ecosystem. So if we go back to 
our time chart here where we can see all these different databases being born in different decades. You can see that Ingress was very early. Um, it, it came out only slightly after System R. System R later on was replaced by DP2 at IBM. And you can see that Postgres had these sort of two phases. First was the university phase, beginning in the mid-80s, and ending in the early 90s. And at, at that time, that was a, a, a Quell system. This, then this kind of black hole of um, in the historical record, because we don't actually have the... Nobody I know has the source control history um, from the, the end of the university Postgres time and the beginning of the open source project. But in that window, the system was changed by um, people from Berkeley to, to use SQL. And then in 1996, the modern open source system that we use today, and we, we can trace all of the commits and changes back to 1996, it began as a SQL system. Um, so it's, it's it's far from the very far from the very first of the um, relational database systems, but it's sort of connected to very early relational database history. Another interesting thing about Postgres is that um, we actually in, uh, developed parallel query execution twice. The university project included it. Um, they had access to to early um, computers that had a lot of CPUs uh, at Berkeley, whereas access to that kind of hardware wasn't that common for the people who developed um, the open source project much later. And in that time window that w where we sort of lost track of the source control for a couple of years, um, that functionality was mostly removed because no one had access to the, to the multi-core hardware, or multi, I should say multi-CPU hardware. Um, but much later, we a, a, a different group of people that I was involved with um, re-implemented parallel query execution. So I think that's quite an interesting, like th th there are examples where Postgres was was really quite groundbreaking and, and quite early on, you know, a major shift. Um, in the modern project, we can say that it has a huge number of com commercial forks and derivatives. And I think the reason for that is that many people who've got, who've got an idea about something they want to try, a kind of special source, they don't want to solve all the problems that a relational database has to solve. And they want a ready source of users or, or they want, you know, assist, they want to be able to get things off the ground immediately. They want client libraries to work and so on. And Postgres is a very good place to start, especially because it has a, 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 a very permissive license. Um, but many of those projects finish up continuing to contribute to the upstream project. And it seems to be pretty healthy at the moment um, as a result of that. So if we look at the data, we can see there's about four to 500 people who are regularly contributing code or or reviewing each other's code. And by that, I'm, I'm looking at email addresses that are um, discussing the development of Postgres on the Postgres development mailing lists. Um, we can see that there's over 100 different employers involved for the people that work on that. Um, and they they have many different kinds of interests, everything from academics, students, consult, software consultancies, or, or database consultancies, DBAs, people who work on proprietary forks, um, and of course, the, the managed Postgres providers and, and cloud vendors. Um, so one thing we can say about Postgres is that it's absolutely not the type of single vendor open source that some other systems uh, represent. That there's no one really in charge. It's, it really is cooperation between a lot of um, equal participants, uh, which I think is uh, pretty special. And it's it, it, there aren't too many projects that you can really say that about, or at least to the same extent. Um, so it consists of about one and a half million lines of C, which is quite an old language. And it is a little bit difficult um, in a way that um, people who want to get involved in Postgres, one of the first challenges is they probably, they might need to learn C if they don't know, don't know it already. And it's not a language that people learn commonly these days. Um, on the other hand, it, it's the goal of the system is to produce a high level language. And sometimes that involves... Um, lower level knowledge and in fact a lot of people work at different levels within Postgres um, closer or further away from the the metal so to speak um, another thing that's quite interesting about our open source model is that it's entirely done by mailing lists which is not unique there are certainly plenty of other projects that are like that usually they're ones where dialogue is really important and it's relatively complex and the um, and it's also obviously correlated with the age of the project 
So we have, it's not totally on a mailing list. There is a web application where we track proposals, which you might say is kind of equivalent to a pull request in other systems or other projects. And typically we have about 300 patches or so in consideration. That number keeps going up. There's a gentle increase in the number of people uh, at the moment. That seems to be the case. Um, all right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how I got involved in Postgres. Um, and I, I'd been I'd been using it for, I don't know, more, more than a couple of decades. And uh, at one point in my... At, my employer at the time was interested in, in moving from one database vendor to another. And one of the features that was uh, missing from Postgres was um, if you were doing a queue-like workload and you tried to use row locking to select jobs from a work queue, um, th there was a bit of a scalability problem, at least with this type of design. And, and that was something that was used in a software product that I worked on. And so, you know, I was determined to try and fix that. And that was my first... Uh, proposal to the Postgres mailing list where I just added the skip lock feature. And you can find that in, um, at the time, it wasn't in Postgres or MySQL, um, but it was present in, in all of the proprietary uh, relational databases. And I was determined to fix that. So um, it began with simply writing an email, right? And just saying, well, here, here's a problem I'm facing. Here's how I think it should be solved. I've looked at the code and I've figured out that this is the pathway that I think um, you know, this this is how I think we solved this problem. And it, it was a, a huge number of people replied and helped me and said, that's a feature that we want. That's that's something that I've wanted myself. And I think you've made a mistake here, here, and here. And, um, and worked through this process of essentially mentoring and development of the feature. And I, I think it was probably a couple of years between that email and the day when I opened up the Postgres um, manual and Ta-da, there was my feature. Um, at the time, I, I wasn't working on, on anything like that in, in, in my daily sort of work. So that was sort of a, a, a late night hacking activity. And yeah, that, that was, was a pretty positive experience that eventually led me to realize that I wanted to get more involved with the project. And I mean, yeah. All right. So one of the things that's great about the Postgres project, and I think probably relational databases generally as a field is just the sheer number of different specializations that are hiding inside this one project. Um, so I wanted to talk just uh, briefly about some of them. Um, there's the obvious things that are obviously like kind of core database uh, topics like query planning. How do you make a query planner? And this whole courses and textbooks and things about that. And query execution generally is just such a broad and vague term that it's almost meaningless to put it on a, on a slide. But um, within... Then there's a whole lot of things that might be less obvious to you that, that, that are specializations within a database. For example, parsers, compilers, interpreters. In Postgres, we use the LLVM library to to do JIT compilation of expressions. That's a whole field of, of, of specialization. There's a lot of things to learn about there and, and to work on. In fact, there's enormous opportunities to use that more within Postgres to make it go faster. Um, there's constant adjustment and revision of 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 basic things like how how you should sort i mean i i so i'm seeing new patches come in just this week that that show a, i don't know i think it was more than 10 percent speed up on 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 sorting operations by new tricks people are constantly there's just so many opportunities in there um then you have other things that i guess might be more more in the classic database obvious database area um different new types of indexes and or access methods constantly being worked on, developed. Um, so many different parts of the system, and I'm not going to go through all the things that I put on the slide here, but just to, just to give an idea, you know, um, system interfaces, IO performance, network IO, so many things to learn about and to, to work on. Um, some of the things that I was talking about in, 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 in this talk, uh, in, in particular the stuff from the early days, uh, comes from reading this excellent book, Making Databases Work, uh, The Pragmatic Wisdom of Michael Stoneberger. And that's a book that came out um, to celebrate his um, Turing Award that he received for his work on data, his lifetime of work on databases. And that includes uh, quite a large, uh, quite, like it includes chapters written by many different people that worked 
in and around the Ingress and Postgres and other related projects um, in, in the early days. Um, there's also a really good history section in the Postgres uh, manual. Uh, it's called the brief history section. And in there, it's actually got pointers to papers that show a lot of the early decisions and goals of the project. Um, another thing that's uh, really good with Postgres is the sheer number of conferences at the moment. Uh, regional conferences, online conferences like this one, and um, kind of global conferences where developers meet up and talk about their work and, and you know, essentially negotiate how how people work together on these things. Uh, of course, the main resource is the Postgres hackers mailing list. And on there, you can find people discussing every aspect of the future of the project. Um, all right. That's the end of my talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this quick walking tour of Postgres.